Welcome to Party Chat Peoples. We are technically four human beings, and we're here to talk about video games and possibly other things. Well, I'm joined specifically. by yeah. human beings James. Hello, James. Stacy. Hello. And Nicole, who has been with us before to talk about It Takes Two. Hello, Nicole. Hello, it's yeah. a pleasure to be back. Yeah, and James has been with us before to talk about role playing games too. Which is yes, good. he yeah. is the number one advocate of not D and D. Hey, there's his voice. <laughs> Often perplexed, pumped it. Yes, that is correct. That's right. But what are we talking about today, Stacia? So uh, I specifically want to talk about scale and perspective in video games, and uh, I'm going to show a little clip from one of the games that I'll be reviewing. There are many, so I won't list them all. Uh, that will kind of give you an idea of what I mean when I say this is what we're going to talk about. So here we go. Video number one. Now, we come here to an extremely important principle, which is the different points of view you get when you change your level of magnification. That is to say, you can look at something with a microscope and see it a certain way. You can look at it with a naked eye and see it in a certain way. You look at it with a telescope and you see it in another way. Now, which level of magnification is the correct one? Well, obviously, uh, they're all correct. They're just different points of view. Okay, so we will, we will come back to this idea later. But the glory of video games is that you can take the different points of view and zoom in and out of them quite easily without any difficulty. Uh, and you can even play games where an object's actual size depends on the perspective with which you view it. And very quickly, from a technical piece, uh, it's from a technical perspective, it is one of the easiest things to actually manipulate in a game space because every game engine worth its salt has three very simple values for scale X, Y, and Z. True. Uh, but I want to start by just saying like what, what made me want to talk about this is realizing how little we actually use this compared to how easy it is to do from a programming perspective, right? Uh, and in particular, why don't we do this when it's one of kids favorite ways to play and something that most adults never entirely uh, give up on, on finding fun. So the examples I came up with for little kids include train sets, Hot Wheels, Barbie dolls and their doll houses, stuffed it's animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Action figures. They love like playing with these little tiny things uh, and pretending that they're are full yeah, there's versions. a reason that the boss of the first Super Smash Brothers is Master Hand. It's because every single kid has done the following thing with their action figures. <laughs> Hello, I'm going to kill everything. No, you won't. I won't let you. <laughs> like that is. My, my, <laughs> <laughs> my Barbies used to party in the the Ghostbuster Mansion. So awesome. Disparity of size, but still doesn't matter. Still back. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So uh, Nicole, since you know, childhood, early education is part of what you're studying right now. Uh, why is it kids like this so much? Well, so, so one of my degrees is in bilingual childhood education and human development and education advocacy, but again, with a specialty in child development and early childhood education. Um, but yes, in studying game design, um, games for learning at um, Steinhardt at NYU, we do a lot of like cognitive science bringing in a lot of these child development and cognitive perspectives on how they learn. Um, so specifically, the correlation I wanted to talk about with um, video games to childhood play is something that is studied in how kids play. Um, and it certainly happens a lot with symbolic play and imaginary play, which is like with dolls um, and like what you're, you're talking about there. Uh, it's called arousal and balance. Are you familiar with that? Mm -mm. So arousal and balance, um, I want to say arousals on the X, Y axis, or I'm sorry, the, what do we got here? This is the y. X. X. That's the Y, thank you. Okay, X is this way and Y is that way, whatever. <laughs> and then they're whatever you label them. Right. Z, is, so Z is this way into the camera. <laughs> so we'll you've get got into that later. arousal that goes from calm 
to high excitement, right? And then you've got balance, which goes from negative to positive. And what they find is, um, you know, when kids are immersed in imaginary play, it has like just kind of this perfect ratio of arousal and balance. And they are studying that. They have been for quite some time now with video games as well. And how if it does, again, hit that right ratio, it can spark creativity in people. So it's interesting that by children inherently doing this thing creatively, it's they're, they're already in that mindset. And then as you become an adult, you can spark it. And they're finding it with even digital games and media that they're finding that that way to spark it. And it makes me think of like, you know, yeah, it's it's bringing you back to that childlike wonder. <laughs> and that's why that's why like we try to talk about every single type of game there is, right? Like when we talk about D and D, which James hates, I'm kidding, uh, but he does like have serious critiques of it. Um, it's it's because of what that play does, right? It's a different form of play versus a standard board game, which has very structured rules and usually very simple rules. It's a different form of structured play than a typical video game. Uh, but like all the different, the, the, the play game divide is like something that people have been arguing about forever. And I think as it applies to scale, the real interesting thing is like when we do and don't use the scale thing, because for me, like my funniest example of scale being like kind of meaningless is in Resident Evil, there was a raid boss for Resident Evil Revelations 2, where you would just get dropped on this island and you could have up to four people technically. And you just shoot at this thing that's off in the distance until time runs out. But the damage that you do is actually being combined with every single other player trying to do the same thing so that eventually you figure out whether or not the community actually succeeded. Like, oh, what the shit <laughs> you go from the single player game to what the heck is what is going on the entire yeah, that game is community is trying co-op to but i think it's only co-op for like two people, two people. but yeah so the but... first time i dropped in i was just like what the fuck am i supposed to do here like this guy just, just doesn't die and he's so far away that it just must feel very strange as well you're used to stuff in resident evil being scary so it's right up in your grill or you're running away from it frantically that's those are usually what you're doing okay so Going back to the subject, I think you're right, Nicole, that we kind of lose this maybe a little bit, what comes naturally to kids. And, and maybe in part, they are training to be miniature adults, right? They're imagining successfully caring for a home or fighting in a war or whatever it is they think they might have to do. Later well, there's a lot of socialized, um, socialized imaginary play, for sure. Yeah, Especially for sure. as children emulate the world that's modeled around them. Right, exactly. But um, as adults, we remain curious about scale, which is why we keep getting better at perceiving uh, larger and larger ratios of scale. So we went from having a regular microscope to uh, super resolution ion microscopes, and from having a telescope to having uh, a satellite telescope or having uh, telescopes in space with enormous lenses working for us. And now we have quantum microscopes. Now that we understand that quantum physics is these little tiny particles so small, we can never ever see them. Um, and even little kids love stuff like, you know, whales and dinosaurs that when they go and see how big they are, and you know, it's exciting to them. Um, and I think- of scale. <laughs> yeah. Should, should, I, should I hit the button? Hit the button. <laughs> All right, uh, so we've got an example of a game that has a Kickstarter uh, called Scale. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push the button, and I believe everyone will be able to hear this. Okay. We don't actually hear anything. Nope. Oh. At least I don't. To be honest, we're, we're not, not missing much, as <laughs> I recall. Yeah, talk through um, it. It's fine. But yeah, you're basically seeing someone go through a world in which there's miniature versions of that world, which it can then go into into infinitely small versions of itself. Uh, and eventually you get to a point where you can see him with his little gun that has a, a scale button and he has scale juice to make things grow bigger or smaller. <laughs> so it's like portal with as, as a scale gun. Oh my God, the gun says can scale. That's, this can gun is scale great. And then nope. Those yep. are your options. 
and you can run out of scale juice. So here this you can is... make something small enough to roll through the arches or make the arches big enough <laughs> for the arch to roll through it. So this is, so let me, let, you, can, you can stop with the, the video. I, I think this Minecraft is a good example. Too. Yeah, it is Minecrafty too. This is a good example of just how hard it used to be to do scale. So this was on Kickstarter in 2013 and people paid $100,000 for this guy to finish the game and he never did. Uh, so that's what happened. That's why there's no game called called Scale. But we do see kind of uh, other things like that. So don't cry too hard because you'll you'll see other stuff later on that's, that makes it okay. <laughs> um, but I do want to say this: it feels like a natural for video games because we have also always loved stories about scale, like yeah. David and Goliath, Jack and the Beanstalk, Alice in Wonderland, Thumbelina, and and to be modern about it, Ant Man and the Wasp. Or and you've got a another. Superheroes. And you've got another one here that you wanted to talk to as like a missed mark of some sorts, right? I know Portal has a ridiculous history of mods that are varying forms of canon. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, so right after the original Portal came out, uh, they knew they wanted to make sequels because it was way more um, appreciated, both in terms of like how many people bought the game, how much money they made, but also it, it was quite a well-rewarded game because it had uh, physics puzzles of a sort that uh, even, even in the science classroom, they would go, actually, this is pretty clever what they did there. Um, you have to think about things like how gravity works if your portal is coming out of the ceiling, yeah. uh, for example, or if it's careening you through a wall towards the other wall. You know. Yeah, it played with uh, scale of momentum, basically, I would say. Like, the concept in that game that you can get hurt <laughs> by having too much momentum is, is basically, like, uh, played with throughout the entire two main games. That's what the boots were for. Exactly, because <laughs> that is the hand hand wavy nonsense that says like you can fall infinitely far down your boots have you'll got be you. just you'll be just fine no matter how aw awkwardly you fall you'll be good oh, yeah okay. so okay. so they had um, a number of attempts to make a sequel and one of them was called f-stop and that's actually a camera term i don't think i want to go into exactly yeah. what it means <gasps> can it i try a while to explain can i try sure Try. Okay, so an f-stop is basically a ratio between two different distances, one being the one that is in focus and one is the one that is out of focus. It works on some sort of exponential scale, I'm pretty sure, and has something to do with exposure. Oh. Okay, you're, you're actually pretty good. It's like the, ratio, <laughs> the ratio of focal length to the diameter of the light entrance, right? So how the, the little hole that light goes through, how big that is compared to how long the light goes before it reaches that hole. And yes, it lets in more light or less light, which leads to changes in explosion, exposure. And the end result can be what looks like a blurry image if, right. if your f-stop is not set correctly. These days yeah, we all have these digital cameras that do it all for us. So we don't and know what's going the only on. reason I know about the term is because I have like uh, film major buddies. And like on a technical perspective, uh, you need to learn that stuff because if you want to do some kind of masterful like change of focus, you need to literally do the math naturally with a uh, game engine, you can go, hey, game engine, I don't like math, you do it. Right, well, and the irony is in video games, everything's in focus all the time because why wouldn't it be? So it doesn't matter whether something's far away or close by, you could, well, you know, with, with the, within the limitations of what the game engine can do, right? So, well, in, in, the, um, in regards to Portal 2, there was so much, uh, demand that they couldn't supply it so they opened up the engine so people were creating their own levels they actually studied it for a couple weeks in one of the game design classes there was a physics pr professor in a high school or a teacher in a high school that he wrote up this huge proposal it was green lighted at this school that he started working at and they studied with portal and because there is some disparity in actual physics that the game engine can't account for they actually brought that in to the classroom and worked out formulas and tested it against hypotheses. And it was really, really cool. Um, but I mean, gosh, we could do a whole episode on- Now like, you're thinking games in the classroom. <laughs> we, you, we really could. I mean, Portal, Portal is a deep subject, but um, F-Stop in particular was an experiment by Valve, the company that made the original game. Uh, and they took, I think it was like three or four 
programmers and a writer and stuck them in a room together. And the idea was you would have a camera and you could take a photo of an object and then that object would disappear from the world and now it's in your photograph. Then later you could reverse this and your object would appear in a different location, right? And having come from your photograph, now the photograph would no longer have that object in it, right? So at first you're just taking something and you're just placing it elsewhere in a way you couldn't otherwise like something too big for a door you could take a picture of it walk through the door and then put it in the next room mm. right but then they move on to saying well if i could make the object smaller i could also get it through the door that way so they create basically three sizes of objects small normal and big so they kind of limit it by only letting you do this to a few objects by only having three possible sizes one of which is the original size uh, and by making sure that you can't take a picture of yourself, for example, and be, be shrunk or grown, they kind of tried to limit. And even then they, deal with, they had to deal with quite a lot of bugs. And then after having done this for a while and starting to become successful at it, they realized that while this was a great idea, nothing about this game had portals in it. So it was not actually a portal game. And then they stopped development. That's what happened to F-Stop. That's pretty funny, actually, because... Uh you know, ha having played Portal 2, it's not that they didn't add quote-unquote features to Portal 2. It's that they added very specific features to make sure that it was intersecting with the actual core functionality of making portals in a way that was fun, I guess. I don't know. And I, it's not that I think F-Stop as a concept is bad. I think it's more that people want to be wowed but not just by like three possibilities they want to be wowed by i can hold a button and this thing just keeps doing whatever it was doing a moment ago right, right. so and that's what scale did but then you would get situations where objects would get stuck inside each other and, and weird weird collisions would happen. which you have a little bit of experience with given a game that i would have taken my controller and thrown it at the television <laughs> fair fair uh so yeah i did want to talk about maquette and maybe you can show the video for that one as, as time permits so it's actually a romance story in video game form so that kind of intrigued me uh, and it's published by annapurna but it's the first development title for this new studio called graceful decay uh, and basically it is about two people who are both amateur artists uh, who fall in love in San Francisco and the game uh, uses their environment and also the imaginary environment they draw for each other uh, as the locations of the game itself. So, uh, for example, there's this big building in, in a central square that looks very much like San Francisco's Palace of Fine Arts. So that features throughout the game. Uh, and here you can see like they draw each other imaginary castles and then that castle might become embodied in the game. And maybe it'll be a full size enormous castle or maybe it'll be a Barbie doll size version of a castle. But most often it's both because inside this dome is another dome that looks just like it, but smaller. And inside that dome is another dome that looks just like it, but smaller. Especially in the dolls. Theoretically. So here you see the guy picks up a small block then when he drops it in the puzzle, it appears in his universe in giant form. So you can change the sizes of objects by playing with where you place them in the universe. Here, a little tiny model of a bridge becomes an actual bridge that helps you get somewhere. And you see pictures of the date where they went to the beach or when they went to the carnival. Uh, and all those things become puzzles of sorts. And eventually you learn that you yourself can feel smaller by going into the bigger version of the world, or you can feel big by standing next to the little version of the world. And, and the last level of all, uh, you can pick up the entire model of the Palace of Fine Arts and move it around. So now really trippy stuff is happening where you're moving yourself from one place to another by, by moving this model. It's very weird. Uh, it's also kind of buggy. In fact, it was so buggy, there's a very specific PlayStation 5 bug that I happened to hit, which breaks the puzzle entirely. You can never complete the game unless you restart it. So, 
And that's that's like that's obviously that's a big uh oh. Yeah. Uh and it's a damn shame that that bug exists and continues to exist in a world where Sony likes to pretend that Cyberpunk doesn't crash anymore. But uh because this game was actually put out for free by Sony under its PlayStation Plus free monthly games. And um you know, you can't fix all the bugs in the world. But a lot of people have experienced this one. This is like a basic QA thing. It is an indie studio, so we don't have to hit them that hard. What I what I was driven slightly crazy by is is just very pedantic, um, but important. And you talked a little bit about how this game would make you motion sick. This game didn't make me motion sick per se. This game made me go, oh my god, the camera's not doing exactly what I'm telling it to do. I want to throw my controller out the window. Like, mm -hmm. it uh, yeah. seems minor, but, but for someone who knows how to deal with cameras in the way that they know they want to deal with cameras, uh, this game can drive you up the wall. Yeah, and, and I do want to say, like, as far as motion sickness goes, these games in general have a higher than average risk of making someone motion sick, right? So if you take a house, right, and then you create an even larger version of that house, but all the textures are the same, now it becomes really obvious when there's like a little crack between one wall and the other, or when you can see each individual picture, pixel in the texture, uh, and it becomes more clear when what's supposed to be a three-dimensional object is actually a two-dimensional plane in place. And so walking through this big version of the world would make me pretty motion sick. And I would have to, I had to stop three or four times before I could complete the game all the way through. But, and I want to show a quick clip of yeah. a game that only takes place in two dimensions, but definitely plays with scale. And it mostly plays with scale of frustration. <laughs> oh, no. So very quickly, here's a game. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. That's not quite working the way I wanted it to. Um, all right. Apparently sharing audio is not going to work right now. Or is it? Can you guys hear that? That's no. what I thought. All right, cool. That's fine. If you know this intro from a certain game involving a blue guy... Uh, you understand like the, the the basic thing that they're harping on here. It's, it's it's Mega Man 2. This is just Mega Man 2. But if I can talk through it for a minute, um, the main thing that this does, other than nostalgia porn, which ah, so much of it. Um, oh you wow! Can see, look at that. You can see that was the the, the rampage thing. Um, yeah, and or King Kong, if somebody doesn't know what that is. Yes. So this was a free game, uh, like a shareware type game. Um, it is titled perfectly. It's called I Want to Be the Guy, the movie, colon, the game. Uh, <laughs> there is no movie. They are just messing with us. And you can see, like, that it just has – it features every single thing oh, wow. that you remember from 8-bit games. Uh, and the this is how the game normally looks. <laughs> so wow. you can see the type of shenanigans that this game does – with oh, scale everything's upside down okay. not just that just now those things are invisible like to do this correctly you have to die so much yeah, like you... there except that he's messing with you that's the game over screen if you die but the person <laughs> playing didn't die so, so it's they this... were able to leave the game over screen and then you're able to do that uh, you can end up in the clouds. This guy's taking a minute. He's very impatient. Uh, now he's going to be in the clouds. And eventually, if I let this go on, you will fight Mike Tyson. Because Mike Tyson's punch out is the most yeah. frustrating game of all time. Uh, so I'm done with sharing that video. But That's so strange. The, so weird. Yeah, it's a... it's. I played the shit out of that game, and I the only reason I stopped playing it is because I hit one boss that I actually had a, a, a critique of. I was like, and it's a pedantic thing again, the intro to that boss fight takes too long. Like, literally, yeah. the checkpoints aren't where I want them to be. That's what made me stop. Because if you die, you just press R, and it reloads so fast that the loop for flow is insane. 
But really what it does with scale is it actually like makes everything that is a threat large and it still follows fundamental rules of very, very, very old games such as Contra, which is if anything touches you, you die immediately. So yeah. it's, it's, you know, old school doesn't even begin to explain it, but, uh, but I, I do want to transition to old school, but you have anything <laughs> else to say? Um, I want one little comment about that because I feel like the nostalgia porn there is like bringing up the arousal, right? So that even it's it's compensating for the negative backslide of the emotion. So it's like that that's the ratio at play. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm also good. I'm also just gonna just show that just for just for a second. Just, <laughs> He's enormous. It's he great. Just, he just killed Mike Tyson. And to be clear, um, if you're playing Way the game. In this game. Yeah, no, it's like it, that was a fake. He's out. shooting bullets um, at him. Yeah, because because it's Mike Tyson, so he's back. Uh, so <laughs> so this this boss took me so many hours. It's not even funny. Okay, so but but when we talk about early games, I do want to say that the very earliest games played with scale a lot. Like the very first video game, you can see it in the Museum of Moving Images in in New York City, uh, was Pong, right? Uh, and it's basically, it was table tennis for two. So the idea on this little tiny screen, you've got this rectangle that's your paddle and a square that is your ball. And the, the simple goal is to hit it back at the other person and not miss it so that it flies through your, your backside. So that became games like Breakup. And now there are about a billion phone games that act similar to that. Uh, that started on that little idea of that little premise. In the same way, you saw a whole bunch of space games early on. Uh, there was a game called Space War on decks in the 1960s and one called Space Race, which that's, eventually became Asteroid. Space War is the one that's actually like typically credited as like, this is the first electronic game ever. Yeah, like, yeah. Really and, yeah, and you can see space raised as well in the Museum of Moving Images. It still functions, this thing, somehow. Um, but, you know, then we've got Galaga, and now we have No Man's Sky. So, again, we still see games that, that play on these old features. And that's almost always when we talk about uh, these uh, high-performing, you know, video game studios that produce video games with, with staffs of hundreds. The only time you see scale quite to that extent is when they're using old video games as a template and they don't even realize how, how they're doing it. Yeah. Whereas the indie games do it all the time. Like uh, Centipede and Millipede in the arcades uh, became Frogger, which, which became an Atari game. And then yeah. now we have the Untitled Goose game, which feels like it's and got that kind of silliness that, that those games did. And I don't think that it's fair to say that like modern indies don't play with scale because it is still just as trivially simple to like yeah. just My mess point with the is numbers. That, that they do it more and they often oh, yeah. do it better. And I, that's the thing I really agree with because um, just take the entire shooter genre, for example, like there's absolutely indie shooters and uh, what the Call of Duties and the battlefields of the world don't do particularly well is play with scale appropriately. It's uh, usually if they're playing with scale, all they're doing is introducing RPG mechanics for the sake of trying to squeeze you out of money with microtransactions. <laughs> and I just I'm man, facts. Uh, and and like the innovation that you actually see is by someone closer. It's still AAA, but someone like the sure. people who did Titanfall, where they go, okay, it's it's a, it's still a shooter but you are both in a mech or on foot. And when you're on foot, you just do parkour and shoot everything. And when you're in a mech, you're in a goddamn mech. So you just wreck everything, but now you're the center of attention. So everyone is out to get you. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and here's where, and time where I can- travel somewhere. And, and time travel somehow. But um, here's like another point where I wanted to get James a little involved because we have a whole genre of video games that are essentially based on Dungeons and Dragons, right? The RPG and all its many variations now uh, started the as- The CRPG. Right, they, they originally used ASCII art and they used some of the same things that Dungeons and Dragons do. They used uh, abilities like strength and dexterity and intelligence. And then you would roll 
uh, virtual dice to see if you succeeded or not. And maybe your character would gain levels or gain new equipment uh, in the same way you do in D&D. And I don't know that that would have been as obvious a thing for people to do if people didn't actually use tabletop mats with little one inch squares and little figures that fit on them, that then you could try to transfer that into a video game world and it made sense. Do you think they always use miniatures like that? Or was that something that somebody came up with along the way? Well, this, the story I heard about how like D&D came around, like, uh, like with, what Gygax and all his friends did when they were young is that they um, originally it was just miniatures wargaming. Interesting. So it's like, like, I, like we'll make jokes about Warhammer and stuff. Right. Um, eventually, but like before that, it was just, you know, like kind of like non-fantasy wargaming. So you had, uh, right. uh, I think they were particularly playing like medieval war miniatures, but like I've seen like, yeah uh, like world war ii stuff a lot like people right. still play those games but it was like yeah. they were playing medieval miniatures war gaming like trying to like some like they were attacking a castle or something like that and they added plot to it so like they added story and other things i see so in and, some ways maybe the miniature came before the dnd effectively i think the visualization aspect of miniatures is what really makes them work or take off or whatever terminology you want to use for that sort of thing yeah. um what, what i think bridges the gap for me is like uh, between a tabletop game and a video game is not simply the rules because every single game needs to have pretty well structured rules in order to actually define uh some kind of distinction between states one of them being preferable and the others being not preferable um that's sort of the the heart of a definition of a game um and play is like here's a bunch of states just who gives a shit but um in 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 tabletop you have the communal storytelling aspect of it which video games have tried to incorporate more and more the more they introduce uh massive multiplayer elements and all that kind of stuff but video games usually fail at that because we're still a little bit in the stage where we're just like look at how pretty everything <laughs> looks look at this mountain look at how fucking amazing it looks and that yeah. is cool but not necessarily like important in the same way that it is in a tabletop game because you've got the people you're seeing their faces real-time communication back and forth etc and so to bring it back to, to scale right like we've mastered the visual fidelity scale pretty goddamn well but we don't really deal with storytelling scale outside right. of certain in certain like developers certain publishers who are basically mm -hmm. like there's too much goddamn money in making a really good story that people will throw 60 dollars at you for right i i do want to say a couple of things one is this is one thing that maquette does get right uh that game we we showed a video for uh it's a, a pretty good story about a relationship it's pretty realistic and heartfelt uh it feels real uh, and he does a very good job towards the end of, of going through the emotions somebody has uh, during a breakup. I don't feel like that's giving too much of the game away. Uh, and using scale to talk about feeling small and about rebuilding your life, things like that. So that's where the game gets, in my mind, actually more clever is at the very end, end of the game. But I also wanted to bring it back to uh, tabletop role playing by mentioning that it feels like in some ways we've gone back to maybe that original concept of miniatures with games like Warhammer, right? We've taken the plot back out again. Is that fair to say? I don't know. Because like... Yes and no. Warhammer, I feel, is like it, it's older than we realize. That's yeah, like true. The, the only thing that makes Warhammer like... like Starcraft completely... is, uh, was inspired by Warhammer. So that's, that's why, like, the, the three races from StarCraft are basically rips from Warhammer. So that's at least, like, early 90s, 80s. Yeah, and, and Warhammer has so many variations, it's not even funny, right? Like, it's, it's you have Warhammer 40K, you have Warhammer, like, with mechs, you have Warhammer, that's pure fantasy. You, like, it's not, there, there is connective tissue, 
but it's the same kind of fantasy connective tissue that like Shadowrun deals with, where it's just like it's all in the universe because whatever, who cares? Like that's just what we want to do. We want to have like in Shadowrun, you've got every single cyberpunk thing ever imaginable, but also you have every single fantasy thing that you could possibly have. Uh, and then Cyberpunk, the actual tabletop game, that's just raw cyberpunk. That's not it doesn't throw in orcs and elves and magic. Um, so you've got all these different window dressings. What makes Warhammer Warhammer in my mind is two things. One is you need miniatures. Like it's it's yeah. pretty much part of the rules. And the other is um, when you play Warhammer a certain way, you don't actually use grid based geometry. You take out a ruler and okay. you actually measure like this dude is X things far away, so on and so forth. Uh, all Warhammer is actually measured in inches, so there there is no uh, grid basis to it. Like there are uh, mm -hmm. particular war games. Never that seen are, anything get the ruler out. Yeah, that's yeah. They, they have their own branded that. tape measures and everything. <laughs> I'm not Sorry. surprised. the The crazy yeah. thing about it is, like, I see, I saw people play Warhammer exactly once in my life. It was at some like store, and it was a miniature of like a, a mech, and he was measuring out like, "I'm gonna shoot you from here." And they had the terrain built up, like it was actually a 3D model of what they were fighting in. And oh, I was yeah. like, "That looks cool," but also, I will never do that much math in real time. <laughs> to play anything ever yes, the the parabola of the arc means that you can't get this no okay i lied you crazy. actually caught me no no i know i know but but stacy actually caught me in a lie i played a game called gorilla one time where you have a 2d <laughs> plane and you have gorillas on each side of the map and you have to put in the angle that you will throw a banana and the power that you will throw that banana with and i was so good at this game that i actually drew a parabola before i knew what one was and killed my brother and he was just like what the shit like sounds he was like pissed. An angry, sounds like an early version of Angry Birds to me. But yes. we're, we're getting off topic. We're getting yeah. off topic. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to bring it back back on. So we're talking right now a little bit more about the mechanics of scale without necessarily a lot of plot. And Superliminal is a very successful version of this. It's a little old. It's 2014. But is if you could play old? that. Yeah. You know, it's a little old. It's not a lot old. But uh, you can kind of see that weird. the... It's, it's got a lot of repetitive objects you'll see over and over again. It's got that kind of f indie game feel to it, which, which it is. It's from uh, some group called Pillow Castle. Uh, and they're quite honest about, like, this is a puzzle game. Uh, actually, I, I just want to take a second, take a, take a little, like, Nicole, if you want to head out, we are good. Thank you for helping. I know you guys have to do. so fun. But thank it's you. Been a joy. Yeah, it's always fun. Nice to have you. All right, I'll see you guys later. Bye, okay. Bye. Bye. Uh, before you jump into Subliminal, can I just do one more thing about minis? Oh, yeah, do it. Have you guys ever rented a storage space? I'm sure. renting one right now. Because <laughs> that was the thing, is like, after, after playing D&D &D for a while, because each square is five foot. It's five foot square. And we were moving my sister in or out of college for for like a semester or something like that. And so we were putting her stuff into storage and it was like, and we got a five by five storage space. So you forgot like, the height, huh. didn't you? And you're like, actually, I'm pretty big in this space. I thought I'd be it's smaller. Like, so when I when I did that, the, the funny thing about uh, moving all my stuff into storage wasn't so much that like I didn't account for the height which I did, it was the moving stuff down the stairs without like pissing off everyone part that right. was difficult. Yeah. But um, but once we got everything like into the space, what cracked me up was like my dad was still trying to like make suggestions and I was like, father, there is a television inside of that space. <laughs> if you move one more thing, I am going to physically remove you from this space. <laughs> Cause he was just, he was just, he was like, well, oh, but if we do the thing and I was just like, stop touching right. the TV. All right. So super liminal, right. super liminal. Let's just show the, uh, it's not going to give really anything away if we're just showing uh, the original thing. The idea is you are a volunteer at a sleep study experiment. And then you fall asleep and you're given some relatively easy tasks 
And in your dreams, you can make small objects big or big objects small because it's a dream world. It doesn't make sense. It's weird. Um, but then you get stuck in the dream world. There's some kind of problem with the technology. Maybe the guy that recruited you to this experiment doesn't really know what he's doing. And you soon find yourself behind the curtains looking at what may or may not be the facility that builds these dreams. Like, how is that real or possible? It's not what what is happening? And then it gets a little scary at one point. <laughs> Sorry, that made me laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can see how we're not only playing with traditional scale and perspective, but we're actually doing funny tricks of the eyes. There's a whole section of the puzzle that just plays with cubes. Like when you go to pick up the cube and make it bigger, it falls into 100 tiny cubes. And it's just like this comical moment. Uh, and another time you do it and the walls of the cubes fall apart and they're just plyboard. <laughs> like, okay, great. <laughs> no, so, <I> do. <laughs> uh, does Super Liminal have better controls than Maquette? Oh, yeah. So here's right. like a relatively bug-free experience. I never had a problem that was based on the mechanics. Now, it helps that uh, these are relatively small areas with a relatively small number of objects available to you. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so some part of the way that they've managed to get a get a, around the bugs is by just reducing the total number of options of things that you can make bigger and smaller. Yeah. The yeah. Environment you can do it in. That's and you classic yourself can never uh, option limitation. Right. 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 Uh, until again, until the very end, at which point you find a way to grow or shrink yourself. Um, and then again, second to last level, I got very motion sick again. Here we go. And uh, I actually listened to, there's like a developer's cut where mm -hmm. uh, they'll put little clouds in the middle of the air. And if you click on them, the developer will tell you some information about each yeah, puzzle. Yeah, puzzle games are good at doing that. I actually, the first one that I remember doing it was Portal on the Orange Box. Um, because, partly because it was the Orange Box. And I think that on some level, Valve was like, we don't know if people are going to like this game. Let's also pull in a special feature because we're packaging it with everything else. And I still remember maybe, writing a review maybe it'll, for college. it'll help them understand what the hell is going on with this game. It's yeah, like anything they've because, seen before. because the way they did it, at least yeah. in Portal, was go through the same puzzles that you already solved and then listen to people talk about it. And uh, that format is perfect for puzzle games and just putting in the developer commentary. It makes sense that indies right. would just basically be like, we can talk about this room. And, and that was that in all their games now because I remember doing that in Left 4 Dead. Mm, yep. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, and uh, this particular level, which is entirely in black and white, they do play around with, uh, like, at one point, you can walk through a shadow and it is actually a door. And then they do the same thing later with a white wall. You can actually walk through the white wall and you end up in an expansive area beyond the wall that you didn't see or realize was there. Mm -hmm. um, and it made me super motion sick because there was no sense of perspective or depth of field. There's no horizon to use to ground yourself to know which way is up or down necessarily. And that really messed with my sense of equilibrium pretty hardcore. You said the magic word, so I have to talk about it. Um, so the, 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 the background that I'm using is, is from a certain game that I don't shut the fuck up about called Horizon Zero Dawn, which has a sequel coming out. And the reason that that game got me is definitely the story. But the real reason that that game is something that I don't stop talking about is because it is one of the only games I've ever experienced that on my first playthrough, I honed in on normal difficulty, I think, eventually, because I was like, that Tyrannosaurus kills me every fucking time, and I'm and I'm tired of trying. And then after the DLC came the out, Tyrannosaurus is like this guy. He's like, yeah, ah, look at you. He's literally, literally <laughs> has lasers and is just like little lasers where he's just like, pew, 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 you're dead, ha! And then like yeah. the um, the DLC came out, and the DLC was outstanding as far as DLCs go, because it works as endgame content, it also works as basic content. After I finished the DLC, came went back and beat the game again, but this time on very hard, using New Game Plus. Then I started a new game, brand new game on very hard, and I was like, how the fuck is this game still entertaining me? I'm genuinely <laughs> confused. So, so like... That's that's what I consider just like scale of difficulty. Like to be able to do 
they have so many difficulties in that game, like normal, hard, very hard, uh, and and then on the easy spectrum, basically the same thing going back. Um, and they all work somehow, and it's and they're doing damage scaling. But what's really going on is that once you've mastered one of them, you can play the game on the next notch and just be like, wait a minute, I don't remember it being this hard because I'm being lazy. And 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 that's the thing that made me just go like, this game is ridiculously good. Um, another game that I think is ridiculously good, if you guys don't mind, uh, if you want to sing, just, just a little sing along, you guys is just. Na 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 Yeah, so I'm playing a video of Katamari Damacy. You have opinions. A lot of people do. What what's yours though? Yours was interesting. Go on, This should not be as popular as it is. Oh, I disagree. This game is a masterpiece of scale. So, the well, it's not okay. A game. I, I just, just for a second, <laughs> so in case anybody doesn't know what is going on right now. So, Katamari and Dynasty originally came out in 2005. Now, there's a version called Reroll in 2018 with updated graphics, although by updated, I just mean doesn't make you motion sick anymore, which the original did for me. But the idea is you are the prince of the universe. And you must recreate the moon that was accidentally destroyed by your dad uh, by rolling up all the objects on the earth because into a moon-sized object. Because he was drunk, to be clear. Uh, <laughs> yes. your, your, your you start out with this little cosmos. tiny sticky ball. And originally your ball can only pick up little things like pieces of paper and pencils. And then the more stuff it picks up, the bigger the ball gets and the larger the object it can grab. Right? Yeah. And the reason that I would say that this definitely is a game is because is four dudes on an elephant so blah, blah, blah. yeah part of it is the existential horror of having little animals and then people and then whole buildings and like everyone is screaming because they're rolling around on this ball yes it's terrifying it's it's, it. it's very terrifying but it's also there's a strange skill to like figuring out how to roll up your ball like properly because you can make it bigger on one axis, but that doesn't actually make it the most efficient ball. And every time you bump it to a wall, you lose some stuff. Not anything that's a really big penalty, but naturally the goal of the game is as big of a ball as possible and as short of a period of time as, as possible. And by the end of the game, you're picking up stuff that makes no sense. And that's fine because the game is Entire essentially domains. a comedy. Yeah, trees uh, don't have roots in this version of the universe, for example. They just yeah. come right up. Yeah. And and like on the very last level of the original, like you can pick up clouds and yes. like other things. And they are and solid objects somehow. Exactly. Yeah. So so it really yeah. ends up being like the perfect capstone to the original design because you're it's always absurd that you're picking up these things and sometimes you're playing the game at such a small scale that it's ridiculous and sometimes you're playing the game at such a large scale that it's ridiculous but it's always ridiculous and on that last level like by the end of it even after you've already completed your goal it's it's really just like what in the hell is going on and and like how do i do it better and faster and, and just pick up more well, like, nonsense why are these people rolling watermelons around uh, i don't yeah this because game is super Japan? Yeah, yeah so james what what bothers you about this game i it, mean it's like it's they took a concept and tried to make something of it but like there's no real game to it it's it's not enough there to be interesting to me not it's like so it's like the, this is a, the plot this is a mini built, game at best the plot no. was built around the gameplay instead of the <laughs> gameplay having any inherent yeah you know purpose right like i would play That's... this in mario party and so be maybe okay with it. in no, your mind overrated mario party. so not not terrible but super overrated yeah and think? it's and it, it feels like busy work it's like i'm not playing anything that's actually interesting it's just, yeah, so I you're not actually enjoy that. picking this stuff up. I would understand level. that as like this a modern cool. critique. The uh, PlayStation original, like this was this was marvelous. Like the games were playing with scale in the PS2 era, just not like this. And uh, the closest thing you could get to like an action movie version of this was like Devil May Cry, maybe, right? Like 
It's uh, it, it, action games usually fuck up scale. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. Yeah, that, that's seen, fair. That's fair. Like, and as I was saying, like, I feel like this is a good idea for a mini game. Like, I've seen it done that way. One of the the YouTube channels I watch is called Versus, and it's mm. um, like a, a static host and a rotating host. And what they'll do is they will come up with some sort of challenge in typically single player games mostly. And they will try and do the same thing on their respective games, trying to beat the other at it. And when they did one that was essentially like uh, three levels of this, is a, I, I guess all the levels are timed. Yes. In Katamari, so, yeah. Yeah, essentially yeah. that they just yeah. kind of did a time trial. They basically, each right. of them was trying to get the bigger ball in like two or three levels, essentially right. like that. So it was that like who sense. could make the bigger ball? Right. And they're playing yeah. independently and you're watching both screens. And it's like, so it's in, in a competitive sense, yeah, that game's work. It's a challenge to do something. But just, I know people do that and it's, and I, they find it relaxing. I just don't know how. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, anything can yeah. be competitive if you just put artificial constraints on it, which is honestly sure. what most video games do in order to pass themselves off as a game. They just go, right. do this as fast as possible or do this as efficiently as possible. Right. Okay. Um, so I kind of want to move on to another one I want to talk about, if you are good with that. Um, I would like to talk about one next. It's called Everything 2017 is when this one came out. Um, developer David O'Reilly. But the important thing is to understand that these are loosely based on a lecture by philosopher Alan Watts, who a very, very long time ago was struggling to explain Eastern concepts of religion two Westerners without freaking them out. So he kind of took some uh, liberties in what those actual philosophies are <laughs> and kind of ended up with a weird mixture of Western science and uh, Eastern philosophy. So he gave like a two hour lecture where he tried to explain to people that they're just a small part of the universe and uh, they're not necessarily all that different from smaller things like animals or even smaller things like bacteria or even tinier things like, you know, cells or, you know, uh, elements. And that in turn, their world is part of the galaxy, which is part of the universe. And if you look at this stuff, you'll see tremendous amounts of empty space between everything. So really, the universe is made up of mostly nothing. And you came from nothing and you're going to nothing. And that shouldn't bother you because actually nothing is the ordinary way for the universe to operate. That's the huge majority of, of what it is. So don't worry about it. Don't be concerned about your afterlife because it's all just nothing. <laughs> yeah, it reminds me of um, Spore because yeah. Spore has essentially the same structure where you start as a single celled thing and then right. eventually you're in control of a space-faring civilization. Um, the only thing that Spore messed up, in my opinion, is mm -hmm. that the only stage in the game that feels significant is the space stage. So yes. all of the quote-unquote genres that it basically hops between before that mm -hmm. is just dicking around right uh so yeah this game yeah. everything i don't know so much about you, how it works right you embody something right and then you can click on anything else to embody that instead so at first you are a horse and if you click on a plant you can it'll tell you you have now become the plant and as the plant you can actually grow identical versions of yourself and this is how you move around right, right. so you, this sounds you, more like play than game yeah and you you can click on larger and larger things until you are a mountain and then you're a land mass and then you're a planet you're a sun and so forth or, or alternatively you can click on smaller and smaller things and the camera image will grow or shrink to your size so as, as a planet you would have difficulty seeing a microorganism, you'd have to do it one step at a time, become, you know, a mountain and then become an animal and then 
now you can see a blade of grass and now maybe then you can become a, a speck of dust, right? So um, the weirdest part is he does kind of a detour towards the end where he talks about how our attachment to inanimate objects is so weird from an Eastern philosophical perspective. And at that point, the game will jettison you into a universe made up of the objects of people who are not present, either because they've given up those things, thrown them out, maybe the person died. And it can talk about people's regrets, uh, having spent so much of their life collecting things instead of paying attention to the people that mattered to them. Um, and it's trying to make a point about the connection of living things to one another. So this is clearly a game that they built based on this lecture. And then they decided, okay, how should a game like this work? If we want to get across his concepts by making people embody what he's talking about, how can we do it? So like this rock that's just kind of sliding around is a funny example. It's a, again, a, an indie game and you can totally tell like the animals don't move the way you expect animals to. They literally, they're just end over end, you know, roll <laughs> around on their backs and their hooves and their, their butts. And it makes no sense in some ways. It's just very trippy. You can see where they were trying to get it done. Like the bugs move pretty normally, like you would expect bugs to. They just must have ran out of time when it came to the mammals. <laughs> it's it's because it's because they don't want the procedural animation to look shitty. So when you're playing as a plant, you can see that you don't so much move as you continuously just die Sorry. and 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 reborn yourself. I don't even know how to describe this shit. But right, it's, it's very trippy. Yeah, yeah. it's very trippy. Uh, the it seems interesting because they actually are making you deal with three-dimensional space, which Spore never even tried to, because it was just like, people don't know how to fucking deal with this. And it's just like, yes, we do. You just need to make an interface that isn't fucking stupid. Um, and the early game of, of Spore was just Pac-Man, which is a perfectly good game to model a stage of your game on. Um, it just doesn't convey the third dimension, right? And that's where I think video games usually lose people, is that to model not just what the third dimension is and looks like and operates like uh, in a video game, but how to manipulate it, actually, that is where you lose 75% of people who have not grown up with dual stick controllers or keyboard and mice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to be fair, this is a PC-based game. I don't know if this would be quite as easy to do on a console because you both need the three-dimensional motion and you also need to be able to independently hover over stuff and click on it. And That's and, that's not hard. I, I can already you know, imagine you could, how you this You could probably do it. Yeah. You probably and do it. As far as I know, RTS this game... Consoles, I'm sure they could exactly. It. And as yeah. far as I know, like this game doesn't isn't doing anything that would be difficult to do because um, as opposed to Spore, where everything's trying to eat you all the time, uh, in this yeah. game, it looks more as though everything's just kind of chilling and like yeah, yeah. non-combative. You, you don't have animals e eating each other in this universe, right. so it because... is, if anything, a little more, a little too peaceful. Uh... Well, it's closer to Flow, <laughs> the actual PlayStation yeah. game sure. uh, from the PS3 era, where everything's in two dimensions, um, and yeah, you're eating stuff and stuff is eating you, but like. It's more of a playful thing. It's not really structured in a way that's like, congratulations, oh, no. you beat the game. No, it doesn't right. really do that outside of just having achievements, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But this, it is a this great game. game. Uh, this big game gets you to make yourself big or small in various ways. Um, and eventually, you can become nothing itself. And then you've reached the point of enlightenment, and the game can start over. You can just end it. Or you can just keep playing with it forever. Each time you embody something, you add it to your like catalog or directory of things. And there are people who are so obsessive about this game, they want to be every possible thing in the game. So they go into the ocean, they hunt around for that fish they have never been, or whatever. <laughs> it's madness. I, if if I play like this, the... if I play this for more than an hour, uh, this game deserves all the awards. And if I play this for more than 10 hours, uh, <laughs> this game 
deserves none of the awards. That is my <laughs> that is my um, oh. arbitrary scale in which I will be reviewing this game. <laughs> is that in a sitting or all together? Yeah. All together. No, like this this looks cool, but like if you explore this and it takes more than ten hours of gameplay, I'm just gonna basically be like, okay, like the play stuff was fine, but like there's no quote unquote game here. Like there's there's game states, but there's not necessarily a win lose distinction. Um, right. and that's fine. I love things like that. But uh you know, I'm I'm harsher on something that basically goes like, look at how cool I am, except there's no real no actual depth there of like the mechanics and, and all that stuff. Obviously I'm a design centric psycho. So I'll also be like the camera doesn't work the way I want it to fuck this game. But uh, that's not the point. The, yeah, this game looks very fascinating, very clean, looks very, very um, good. Like it scales up even right. Like this probably looks amazing in 4k <laughs> the way that like something like flow does. Um, it's it just has the most pretentious name of all time. <laughs> it's, it's just called everything. What? Uh, but you know, it's the interesting thing is if you look up this cat, David O'Reilly, he uh, has done a few independent projects. He's you know tenured at a university, so he works with his kids in a class. And I get the feeling this is one of those projects where he had a few students helping him out. And um, he also does animation for random TV and and video games like i think he did um this minutes and the loki show that's on disney plus right now uh so the dude's a strange cat <laughs> what's his and name david o'reilly oh, okay. anyway anyway um so this is a good one and the last o'reilly one wanted... like the o'reilly books dude that guy <laughs> yes it's spelled the same way i have no idea if there are any relation i doubt it that's fine there's a yeah, lot of no. o'reilly's in the world you know ah, but, yeah <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, no, no, no. I only mentioned that because uh, it reminds me of the Tron guy that I worked with one time, but um, also because he was at NYU. <laughs> right, right. So the last one I wanted to talk about on the indie front is Giant Celebration. And I'll preface this by saying I actually have not played this because I got seasick so often getting ready for this podcast that I just couldn't do one more. And this one's in virtual reality, so there's a 99% Ooh. chance it's going to make me vomit. Nice. Uh, <laughs> frankly. But, Are you uh, ready for some giant celebration? <laughs> giant celebration. Yeah. So the idea is you're trying to get a band back together and uh, you got to get together the crowds, you got to put together the stage, you got to get the instruments. And these things may be super tiny in your living room or <laughs> they might be enormous, uh, so big outside your city that you think it's a building, right? Uh. Uh, so they're uh, in early release you can get this off steam now and they're very actively asking for people to give them ideas to further pad and make the story interesting i mean the band looks pretty cool and the music sounds pretty neat so they have a good idea going there but they're clearly still working on it yeah um, that's pretty cool like the um since it's vr only they're gonna have all manner of issues um the biggest one being motion sickness but the funny thing about motion sickness is that it doesn't necessarily work the way people think it does it's not about um this thing is moving around too fast though that is the central component of it it's really about the mixed signals that your brain has between the various sensory input that it has so when my brother played a rock climbing game in vr um, his knees started to do the wavy thing because like just intuitively he was like this is bananas and it was that he doesn't get motion sick the way that I do because everyone has their own version of motion sickness um, mm -hmm. but but like he was like whoa this is crazy which made it extra funny when he beat the level and his wife shoved him a little um, and so like that you know he, he had a he had a minor what like what was that what's wrong with you kind of moment um but but to go back to uh the band thing for a second um all you need to do which they i, I see them doing correctly there in in the experience is like all the movements need to be real slow you don't need to like force the person to do this as long as the game is tuned correctly so that they can do this 
but they can also like push a stick and it'll do like a 45 angle fade in fade out rotation right. yeah and as long yeah. as there's no time pressure you'll be okay but you can't just do the usual thing in vr of saying i want to stand over there and then just zip to it or i want to face this direction you also have to go i want to be this big i want to be that big and there has to be some way to send that signal to to control the game and i'm not quite sure how that how that works so i mean it's probably just a button press or two right like you've got yeah, everything in vr true. now has like the wands right like effectively you've got two controllers whether it's the wands that the htc vive has or the actual touch controllers that the oculus has everyone has their version of pointer devices that have buttons on them that's the yeah. common denominator in all yeah. vr so right. you know just hold the button move up, move down. The sensitivity on that gesture can be played with, but you really just need to like point at something and be like, hey, you, button. And now you're like scaling it up, scaling it down, etc. cetera. Um, move to point or scale to point? Uh, yeah, kind of, right? Like acquire target is usually one button. And then maybe there's another like secondary that's like, do I want to move there? Do I want like, and it can be on the other hand so that it's not super confusing for people. Um, so, you know, obviously everyone is doing games in VR is trying to figure this shit out their own version of it. The, um, eventually we we'll... haven't got virtual walking down yet. No, we're still working on that as far as I'm concerned. I disagree. So there's several zombie games that basically have this down correctly. So you need the configuration so that people can actually teleport or physically move or push a stick to actually right. move the controller right so i mean yeah. there are, there are options and if you look at something like ring fit adventure and the way it puts a thing on your knee and can tell when you're lifting your knee up i mean it's pretty obvious how we could I explore how this would work in vr so right? we have the technology just not the living room well, and we also, the, the technology, when we talk about that, for me, also refers to the quality of the graphics, which has a lot to do with your video card and your, your PC specifications, right? Your and the price of the processor headset. and your, the amount of RAM you have. I mean, um, when 3D games first came out, you know, regular video games, they almost always made me motion sick. Quake 2 was infamous. It would take less than five minutes for me to want to barf every time I played that game. Um, but they don't do that anymore. Obviously, I wouldn't be playing games at all. It's, it's almost unheard of. It takes games like this, which are attempting to do something weird, or really old school games or games that are made to look old school can still trigger that response. In yeah, the, my favorite example. Every once in a while. Mm. Yeah, virtual, my, my favorite... vir virtual reality, I think, is an additional video challenge, putting you in there and then trying to move everything around you in real time at that size is not easy. Well, you know? it's not easy to do it in a way that doesn't scare the living shit out of people. But the <laughs> yeah. but the but we're getting pretty good. So like the new the newest Valve console, the Index, right? Uh, for for VR, that has a particular design for its headphones. Um, and obviously you can swap this out with whatever setup you have for your audio for your PC, but it has an actual internal thing that isn't actually on your ear. It is instead just off your ear projecting sound into your ear, which obviously based on your head shape, you know, you need to make sure that this thing actually works for you. But uh, that is actually like the way that they deliver sound. That way, literally, if mom goes, yo, take that shit off, and you're playing a game where you're shooting the hell out of everyone, you hear her as opposed to her touching you and you accidentally elbowing her in the face. Like, that's a real <laughs> VR concern. Yeah. So, uh, going yeah, back to Eventually, the... that's why we talk about augmented reality, or they'll call it mixed reality, uh, sets where you can like see through the glasses into real life. You can mix the computer graphics with your real world in the way you can with like Pokemon Go. You yep. see a little Pokemon on your camera. Um, uh, go ahead. Are they, you think they're working on anything? Like I, I had a pair of uh, contact headphones, like the vi the vibrating temple ones. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, it feels like the audio is lagging a little bit behind the video with these with these VR sets. Yes. But I say that, but if you've ever had 7.1 surround sound on your regular PC headphones like these, 
uh, like it has a little little button you press and you can turn your yeah, seven and- point one on. If you if you've ever heard that, it's actually quite good. So there's no reason why you can't stick this in a VR. Headset. Yeah, Sony Sony pretended as though 3D headphones were something that they invented by just going like the PS5 will support 3D audio, and we don't know what that is, but fuck you. But the reality yeah. is that like if you buy a PlayStation headset, the sound quality is a little bit better than 7.1. That's not hard to do. It's just positional audio, and the APIs for that on a technical level, the shit that the programmers have to actually interface with are always going to be the thing that determines whether or not the developers actually end up using it or not. So for example, uh, Windows announced that in Windows, whatever the hell they're calling the next thing, I think 11, um, the uh there will be an actual api for positional audio um and i think there's also going to be an actual api for i want to use the um the ssd specifically because um every single person right now who's building a pc uh usually is going to go for an ssd for trivial obvious reasons um but uh, the APIs weren't there. And and now right. with the next generation of consoles, you actually got PS5 just having everyone just go like, look at how fast this loads. This is insane. And because of that, uh, you know, Microsoft was basically forced to be like, oh, yeah, we should probably make an API for that. Yeah, you think? <laughs> it, when you're being outclassed by a PlayStation, you need to, to rethink your strategy, seriously. Um, yeah, but it, mind if I steer it back towards... Where, where we're going with this, the, the actual <laughs> perspective and scale. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I do think that VR is a frontier that this is going to become more of a thing in because there's definitely this kind of wow factor people want when they first use VR. And one way to do it is to have the equivalent of an IMAX video. Uh, and that often means looking at big things like landscapes, like what's behind Zavi or flying through space uh, or alternatively, you'll see like little nature documentaries that just follow an ant around and that yeah. kind of thing appeals to people. So, well, the um, best success yeah. of, uh, early, early on in VR, the best success of like non motion sickness inducing locomotion in games was actually, uh, Oculus exclusive. Um, and I forget what it's called, but it's basically Ender's game, the game, uh, mm-hmm. but you mostly just explore. Uh, on a space station, you're in zero G, and the fact that you're in zero G helped people to understand how it works because that's more intuitive. Um, the only thing that was weird for people is just like that's not where my feet are, right? So, mm-hmm. so if the fidelity is good and you got your setup right, and your computer is good enough to actually do the tracking in a in a in whatever lighting setup you have, that game was actually very easy to deal with stuff because all you do is you put your hand on a wall and you just go you push off so that can be motion sickness inducing for people but uh it's pretty clear and it's also a game where like if you just go out into the black of space you're gonna die because you float forever anyway so scale so don't do that yeah so scale uh i wanted to mention a few others that are less centrally about this, but they're still important. So we talked about Katamari, and I feel like a close cousin to that is Donut County, which is a mobile phone game that came out in 2018. Uh, And I think we have a video of that one, it's very simple. But the idea is that there is a donut hole, a physical hole in, in this county in California, and it is eating things and it's going to eat us all and it's terrifying. Uh, only this is like with cute little animal people. So it's, it's not as terrifying as it would otherwise be. And it's the great mystery of like, how did this donut hole get to, to be here? Why is it growing bigger and bigger? And you get to like embody the hole. So this is like a little campground and you can see that the owner has now, uh, you know, this, this size hole. So it can start to fit in things like cans of rocks, but um, it becomes sort of like a puzzle game eventually. So eventually you're going to swallow up this campfire, which makes sense. It's one of the next bigger things to get. But once you do, now you also have corn. What happens with fire and corn? Well, okay. So now we'll see what happens. But um, you can't really leave a level until you eat everything in it, including the people. So this is where it feels a little bit like Katamari, 
So as you can see, we pop, we pop the corn, that's what happens. And then the birds come and then you can also swallow up the birds and that's- It's a cute so little story. Weird. It's a cute little game. The, yeah, it's definitely a game by the same definition as Katamari is definitely a game. Uh, and what I think is good about this one is they got it to work on a phone. Uh, it only takes a few hours to play. It has a story to tell. It doesn't overstay its welcome. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a cute little game. I like it. And, and the fact that the hole grows bigger and bigger means you can swallow bigger and bigger objects. So you get that sense of, of scale. And so like, I think Portal, the sequel should have a Portal hole gun because that's awesome. Let's do it. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I also want to talk about Pokemon Sword and Shield. This is the most cynical use of scale I've ever seen. Basically, <laughs> hey, little kids, you love Pokemon. You know what you'd like even more than hold on, Pokemon? Hold on. Don't spoil it. <laughs> I'll show you what's a huge improvement on the Pokemon that you have known and loved forever. It, it's this. It's called Dynamax. That's what it's called. It's really dumb. Uh, you, may, you, you make it really big. That's all. <laughs> oh. So, so I say it's really dumb, but uh, to be fair and clear, I want to be clear. Uh, I'm only halfway through Pokemon Sword. I actually think it's excellent. I actually think that Pokemon the game itself, or this the weekend? game itself, and okay. the franchise as a whole. Uh, sure. Pokemon is my favorite Classic. RPG, and it's not for not only for nostalgia reasons. There's stuff like Temtem that's out there that I haven't tried yet, um, but. Dynamaxing is correctly limited in a $60 game. If you play Pokemon Go, right, they introduced the idea of, like, you're fighting this thing, but it's so goddamn strong that you can't even try to do it by yourself. That's fine. That's normal. That's just how Pokemon Go works. Dynamaxing does the scale thing, and it almost does the same thing as, like, when you're fighting a giant thing. But you only can do it in very specific battles, and that's part of what sure. makes it good. It's basically um, gym battles as well as what they call the raid battles. And uh, mm -hmm. the raid battles, when you play online uh, with other people, like they're kind of stupid. They're, they're trivially easy, but they don't award you any experience points whatsoever. They will award you candy that you can actually give to arbitrary Pokemon in order to level them up, but that's not the best way to train them. Oh my gosh, it's just so... Uh, Eevee, but right. huge. Yeah, and they put little red clouds to indicate where the skyline is, so you can get a better idea of just how big they are. Eevee! I oh forgot gosh. this was a thing and thought you were going to talk about like how in the, like the, in the original Game Boy games, they showed you like your like full detailed sprite and then shrunk you into like the mini sprite that you played. <laughs> right, that's, that's also fair. I mean, Pokemon games have come a long way from when they first came. Yeah, Don't get me game, wrong. This game looks way too it's just, good for, yeah. like, mm -hmm. a game that scales up to 4K. Like, it, it's, it's, it's on a Switch, which, you know, means that the frame rate is not going to be high. Yeah. But, um, but for a game that's not doing native 4K, like, I can play this on my TV and just be like, that was cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, and it doesn't look cool. It's just like, the, it's sad that when I talk about big studios and how they use scale like this, this is kind of it, you know? Uh, although there is It Takes Two. We reviewed that last week. That's a good example of a game. Um, and, and the plot line makes a pretty good case for it. Um, it's essentially an attempt at a couples therapy game. So you're supposed to play it with somebody else who is sat next to you. It's really hard to complete this game without communicating well, you know, which is both Bring good and bad if you're a couple. Right, right. Yeah. But essentially what's going on here is you become these little, little guys. And how this happens is your daughter is upset that you're getting divorced. So she has two little dolls who look like her parents. And when she cries, they're, they're their brains get downloaded into the little dolls, and now they must navigate a, a world where everything is big. I think you it's mean honey. I shrunk the kids, except <laughs> for the parents instead of the child. Yeah, yeah. Honey, we shrunk it, ourselves. <laughs> yeah, something yeah, like that. The sequel. Uh, <laughs> the sequel. The 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 thing that I liked about this game in terms of scale, though, is um, it also tells the story of a relationship. 
uh, much like Maquette does. But what I think this game does exceedingly well isn't, uh, you know, shrinking and growing or whatever. Um, It has good fidelity, but what it really does is it tells a story and it plays with scale in order to communicate to the player what it feels like to be this couple that have decided they're fucking done and they happen to have a kid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it, because they're shrunk small, they can then embody their everyday ordinary problems as if they are enormous issues, which is what they feel like when you're a struggling couple. So the fact that their vacuum cleaner doesn't work may seem trivial, but if that vacuum is now the boss at the end of the level and he's trying to suck you in and you're terrified, that's a whole other story, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's an example. Yeah. So Um, it does a good job of surprising you at scale, I think, because uh, it goes to certain places and you're just like, what are they going to do now? And they do the classic thing, which I think was honestly originally originally made popular with the first God of War, which is um, giving you new mechanics, uh, but never overwhelming you ever, 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 ever. And so the way they do that is just they take away mechanics occasionally, which gives you a reset. But every single new set of mechanics that you have to deal with, they're not just simple puzzles. They're not just um, action that is novel uh there it's always thematic it's always related to whatever the characters are going through uh and it's always fun yeah it's a genuinely fun little game uh it is longer than you might expect it to be if you're not used to playing full-sized you know playstation games um and i had imagined that in every couple there's going to be the one that is not used to doing this stuff luckily this is a game that's very playable even if you're very different levels of skill it's fine you'll get through it Anyway, um, so I did like I did like its use of scale, and the last one is actually yours that you wanted to mention, uh, the Crew Two, because yeah. here's the thing: this is a game about racing cars, boats, and planes. That's what this game is about. So why is this about scale? Because the map shows you what these companies could be doing if they wanted to, and they're just <laughs> not. They're just not. <laughs> but look what they can do. So this is your home inside the the world where you are a racer who's trying to become famous right you, you have a certain number of followers this guy has forty four thousand followers it's in the top right you have a certain amount of money to spend on cool cars and boats and planes and you have the ability to go to different races either in your neighborhood or elsewhere in the country so they have a map that is the size of this country that you can zoom yeah. in and out of randomly to any point on it and it works we like, just works. That's so, how good they are at this now. And that's yeah. why I think this is like the a strange um, uh, bedfellow of Ubisoft mastering. Like, to, I want to be clear. They have mastered open world stuff, right? Like, they are the company. They're the people that, that do this shit. And uh, partly because of that asshole. But the... Uh, the way that they actually like have the scaling working in this game is really good because um, it's not a model representation of the United States. That would be fucking stupid. Instead, they have these miniature little snapshots of each city, and they've really like tailored it a certain way. Um, some dumbasses in the first the first one that came out were just like, "It's not to scale." It's just like, "Shut up, go away." But nobody really uh, wants it to be to scale. Yeah. So I I played this a little bit this weekend because it happened to be a free weekend for this game. It also happened to have been on sale. I ended up picking it up. Uh, normally, it's like $50, $60. It was $10. Um, that is with the PlayStation Plus membership discount that you get. And it was easily worth the 10 bucks, even just for like what I played for free. I look forward to playing it more. And what I discovered about this game uh, is that it's actually a pretty good middleman in the racing genre so far between simulation and, and arcadiness. Because um, if you're driving around in a city, you'll accidentally murder someone, because, duh. But uh, Yeah, if, I don't love the fact that the street racing games have actual pedestrians that you can run over. You're Not supposed to feel out. bad, especially um, if it's a racing game. Death but, Race, Death Race 2000. 
<laughs> I, yeah, I, like I'd sure. be surprised if that like wasn't something that someone put made a mod for on like PC and was just like turn them off because it freaks me out. But um, right. Right. what do you call it? The yeah, you can see here like the the scale that we're dealing with, the way that they've modeled certain states and all that stuff and and, and so on. But uh, what I think is effective about the scale in this game isn't necessarily like I'm driving across the entire United States. Da, da, da. It's the illusion that you're driving across the United States. It's actually very well done. Um, you can, instead of picking any of these icons and just insta-traveling to them, which works wonderful on the PS5 because the SSD, et cetera, et cetera, um, you can basically just uh, set a waypoint and just be like, I'm going to drive there. How long is it going to take me? I don't know. You start trying. You get impatient and you just teleport there. Or like me, you just keep driving and dicking around and there's a whole tree for exploration in this game and it actually rewards you for pressing a button when it says to take a picture of a fucking coyote and then you can rewind time try to find the fucking coyote and take a picture of it and then it's like here's some points congrats <laughs> and and yeah. that is actually like to me just as fun as playing a race for an hour in order to actually get a good run and end up going from last to first uh yeah. so so yeah this this game is, is very good so far um and and what it does with scale uh in terms of zooming in zooming out i think is brilliant in a lot of ways and should definitely be studied by anyone who's trying to you know yeah, they they have a photo mode big. where they ask you to go take photos of animals you can go on your plane and then go into photo mode and zoom in so closely that you can see the rabbit on the ground mm -hmm. and it works it's great. Yeah. I've, I've seen two games that act like this. I, mean, I remember there was an RTS years ago that came out, and it was like, like it, I think it, well, it didn't become popular because otherwise I remember the name. <laughs> but it was like its claim was that like you could uh, fight the battle in like any scale. Oh, so it's like up. you could do yeah. like unit level combat and then zoom out and do like. Uh, detachment level combat to zoom all right. the way out to like full army. And it was like, actually was, an RTS? I believe so. Like, I remember seeing ads for it. To, it would have Is to it be. in a Total War series? No, I, it was like okay. something independent, but it was like, like that was the concept. And then there's another game that I found on Steam a while back that I never, like, I, I looked that I thought about playing, but I didn't get into it. It was called Angels Fall First. And it's kind of like that same concept of like sci fi. You could go like, zoom out from like armada battles all the way down to like first person shooter mm. you are infantry guy gotcha nice nice so yeah but we we can see the potential right we can see how good this technology is now and uh how they've already kind of got the tools that they need by this point right so i'm going to call out like some companies here hey you know nintendo and and activision and EA and Epic Games and, and Ubisoft, please stop making sequels that make your existing franchises worse. And here's an idea that is almost guaranteed to at least get you enough people to get your money back. Make a game built on perspective and scale because everybody loves that. And it's not that hard. You can totally do it. <laughs> it's almost not that hard. It, it, so in terms yeah. of like actually, you know, <laughs> Portal's hard. Uh, but sure. but the... In, in terms of like actually um, figuring out how to integrate it into the mechanics, that's where the that's where the magic happens, so to speak. I look Absolutely. forward to Division Heartland because that is going to be a straight up free to play Division game, which means they're either going to fuck it up royally or <laughs> they're going to find the right balance. I actually don't even know if Massive Entertainment is behind that one. I hope so, but. Um, that game is going to be one to look out for in terms of Ubisoft and their attempts to deal with scale. Um, mm -hmm. The others, I don't know, man. Like Activision is just going to keep printing money. They don't give a shit. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even bother with Tencent because it's like, okay. yeah. Once you got loot boxes, you don't go back, right? I don't but know. You try, can make try infinitely, infinitely small loot boxes or infinitely large loot boxes. I mean, Why is this? <laughs> if you play a Riot Games game, congratulations. Depending you're playing on how a much money you game. Right. Yeah. If you give $100, then you get a house sized loot box. And if right? you only throw a yeah. dollar, it's like. Little, little ring box. Yeah, little ring box. Yeah. You know, it would be a fun topic for, for another episode. 
what is what is your floor and ceiling for microtransactions? <laughs> wow, we could talk about that for a while, but that is not that is not what this one is about. So if you guys don't have anything else, I have a, a going out video I want to play. Uh, it's again from everything, which I think does a fantastic job in this moment, even if it's kind of unintentional. Uh, our philosopher has a great way of explaining how, how scale is play. Good? All right, I'm gonna go for it. So, share my screen, make the video big. Let me know if you don't hear it. Magnification on your skin, take out a magnifying glass, and you don't see the familiar skin anymore. You see all the pores with hair sticking out. Change it again and get a microscope, and you see cellular structure. Get an ion microscope, and you see molecules. And we know that it can get smaller and smaller and smaller, and that the spaces between these minute units are so vast that they're comparable to the distances between the sun and planets in scale. So also with time. So in this sense, there could be vast, vast universes full of empires and battleships and palaces and brothels, Cut the brothels. and restaurants <laughs> and orchestras in the tip of your fingernail. Hey, it's the oldest profession, right? And on the other hand, we could be all going on in the tip of somebody else's fingernail. All right. And we're all one and, and the universe is peaceful and when you become nothing, you win the game. But I'm hippie not stuff. super hippie stuff. We don't we don't all have to be like that. It's a little much, but yeah. <laughs> I, I look forward to seeing this explored more. It's, it's gonna happen one way or another, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh the simplicity mathematically in a game engine of doing the thing where you just make it smaller or bigger is too simple for anyone to ignore. Uh, I think the rubber meets the road when scale actually meets theme. Sure. Uh, and it feels correct. How about Ant-Man the video game? Marvel's, if they're not already thinking about it, they're fucking idiots. They should be. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for talking about this. I appreciate you coming on, James. Giving sure. us your perspective. And uh, Nicole, though she didn't stay with us to the end, it was great having her on as well. And thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we've been people, technically. Uh, there were four of us once. There, yes. there are three of us now. And there will be zero of us in five. Four. I'm waiting to get the results back in my turn. Three, two, okay. Fair. one.